Hey everyone, welcome to My Wife the Dietitian, a weekly podcast about lifestyle and healthy eating. I'm Rob and together with my wife Sandra, we invite you to join us on this informative yet entertaining journey through the complex world of healthy eating. We'll cover everything but the kitchen sink. Each week we'll discuss topics ranging from how to protect yourself from developing cancer, spicy foods to rev up the libido, to caring for your palliative grandfather with Alzheimer's. We'll also delve into more complex issues like, what the heck is oat milk? Why doesn't my butt fit into these jeans? And every guy's favorite question, will eating spinach really make it bigger? Join us each week as we strive to educate, enlighten, and entertain you. Vitamin K comes from the German word coagulation, spelled with a K in German. It's no surprise then that vitamin K helps with blood clotting, something that we need when we get a cut or injury to help stop bleeding. For people who are at increased risk of blood clots due to a variety of reasons, your healthcare team may have prescribed blood thinners such as warfarin. These blood thinners have a relationship with your intake of vitamin K in foods. Today, we have a special guest, registered dietitian Katie Dodd from The Geriatric Dietitian and we discuss the important considerations of vitamin K in the diet and blood thinners. Episode 46, Vitamin K and the Warfarin Diet. Diet for blood thinners. Oh, the warfarin is for is something you take is a blood thinner. That's correct. Yeah, okay. I'm going to learn a lot today, I think. I think so. Yeah, well, we have a special guest today, Katie Dodd, registered dietitian from the Geriatric Dietitian website. Okay. Yeah, she wrote a really excellent article on diet for blood thinners, the warfarin diet, vitamin K, and warfarin. And I'm presuming there's a relationship between vitamin K and warfarin. We'll learn all about that when we interview Katie. I knew you were going to say that. Okay, so shall we... Uh bring her on we'll That's... bring her out she's hiding behind the curtain right now we'll uh <laughs> katie are you back there yes i'm here <laughs> yeah she's she's waiting anxiously to come and talk to us i'm sure so it didn't sound like katie no it doesn't <laughs> but it's my best katie impression <laughs> sorry katie um okay let's uh bring on katie dodd great so we're here today with katie dodd dietitian from the geriatric dietitian she's an esteemed colleague and expert on geriatric nutrition and we're here to talk about vitamin K and the warfarin diet, diet for blood thinners. So Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited <laughs> to be on the podcast. Oh, yeah. The uh, Your article, your recent article on the warfarin diet and diet for blood thinner, it was a good thing to see because I have clients all the time that have, uh, they're on blood thinners and somebody has told them like their nurse or a family member has said, oh, you can't eat spinach anymore. And so they come to me in a big panic and ask, what does, what's going on? So what is warfarin? Yeah, yeah. So let's kind of dive into the basics here. Warfarin is a type of medication that's taken to prevent blood clots in certain people who have an increased risk for clots. So maybe they have a history, they've had a heart attack, maybe a stroke, pul pulmonary embolism, irregular heartbeat, or, or or anything along that line. So some people may hear warfarin called Coumadin. Coumadin is the, the name brand for warfarin. Warfarin is the generic name. Or you might just hear it called blood thinners. We hear that a lot. I'm taking a blood thinner and it's warfarin. <laughs> so <laughs> there are, um, so again, Coumadin is the name brand, but there are lower cost generic options available. And when we say blood thinners, we're talking about a specific class of medication called anticoagulants. And to break that down, easy peasy for people listening, coagulant just means to form a clot. Anti means opposed. We put that again together and anticoagulant is to stop blood clots from forming. That is the goal. And if we're breaking it down even further, warfarin is acting to thin the blood to prevent those clots. So of course, it's much more complicated than that on a scientific level. But just really when we're talking to people, that's the basic way of understanding how this medication is working in our body. So I know we're talking about warfarin today, but there are other types of blood thinners and a lot of them end with the word ban. And I am not good at pronouncing medications. That is not my <laughs> strength. But a few other anticoagulants um, in addition to warfarin include a pixaban, um, endo, oh golly, endo, endoxaban, um, <laughs> 
Golly Heparin, Rivos, Zaxaban. Those big words are always, they're always yeah. fun to say, right? Yeah. <laughs> I always give Sandra a hard time about that too. So. <laughs> Oh my alone. goodness. Yeah. Yeah. It is not my strength <laughs> saying these big complicated words, but ultimately there's a lot of different blood thinners and it's really, um, you know, the healthcare team that you're working with will determine which blood thinner is best for you. It's usually based on your health history, your diagnosis, your individual situation, but we do see a lot of people who are, are on warfarin, which requires some, you know, things to consider when it comes to diet, which is why I'm really glad we're having this conversation about vitamin K, the warfarin diet, all of these things. And, right. you know, interesting when I was uh, looking more into this uh, recently, vitamin K came from the German word for coagulation spelled with a K in German. And oh. so that's so interesting because eh? I guess that's the biggest role vitamin K has is uh, we're learning more and more about vitamin K, but um, yeah, it, it does help the blood clot. So yeah, let's, uh, what is the relationship of vitamin K and warfarin? Sure. You know, and you just said it, when we think of warfarin, it is preventing the clots while vitamin K helps the blood to clot. And that's a wonderful thing. I mean, we get a cut, blood's coming down our arm. We want our blood to clot to stop that bleeding, right? Absolutely. So, so blood clotting is good, but we don't want our blood to clot so much that it clots and blocks the artery and leads to a stroke or a heart attack. Right. So you know, this is really oversimplifying it. But again, I, I like this, especially when we're explaining these kind of, which can feel like confusing or overwhelming topics to clients. But if we think of warfarin as a blood thinner, we could almost think of vitamin K as a blood thickener. Again, mm. scientifically, that is not what is happening. But it's it's thinking that they're kind of working in relationship to each other, kind of working against each other. One thickens blood, one thins blood. So that's kind of the relationship of how they work together is and like, that was interesting to hear that vitamin K comes from that German word, meaning the, the coagulant, because warfarin is the anti-coagulant. Anti so, that's yeah. the relationship. Exactly. Okay. Yes. What can someone do with their diet to keep the warfarin working well? So what someone could do to help keep the warfarin working well, I think, uh, you know, when we're considering this relationship between warfarin and vitamin K, how they are kind of working together, the key is consistency when it comes to vitamin K. And you mentioned this at the beginning that so often people are told I'm on warfarin, I cannot have vitamin K foods, I cannot have greens. And that's actually not true at all. We just need to be consistent. And you'll hear me say that word consistent over and over and over again. <laughs> but what does it mean to be consistent? It just means make sure that you're eating the same amounts of foods that are high in vitamin K on a weekly or daily basis. So we want to make sure that we aren't suddenly eating this large amount of vitamin K foods, or if we are eating, you know, vitamin K on the regular, we don't just suddenly stop. An example of what that could look like, maybe you're drinking some type of um, nutrition supplement that contains vitamin K and you're having a nice, good green salad every day. You're doing that every single day and then you just stop. We want to be mindful of that, not to just completely stop because that can impact the relationship between the warfarin and the vitamin K. So mm -hmm. it's it's really just about the consistency, making sure there's no sudden changes of adding too much vitamin K or taking it away. And if we do make those changes, making sure that they're done gradually and in conversation with your healthcare team. If you are on warfarin, you are working really closely with your healthcare team. You are getting blood work done to determine, okay, how should we adjust your dose of warfarin? And they adjust your doses based on all of the things. So if you're eating a lot of vitamin K, your warfarin dose is adjusted based on that. And if you stop eating that vitamin K, well, gosh, that, you know, warfarin dose may need to be adjusted again. So, you know, a, a lot of the warfarin diet comes down to understanding that diet, specifically vitamin K, can impact our blood levels and the doses may need to be adjusted. So just consistency, I guess, is what it comes down to. Consistency and working with your healthcare team. Absolutely. How sensitive is your intake of vitamin K? Like if you're on warfarin, uh, like my dad, for instance, is on warfarin and I know he'll always say, oh, I can't eat grapefruit because I've, I'm on blood thinners. But does that mean he can't eat one grapefruit or does that mean he shouldn't start eating grapefruit? every day if, or it's going to th throw things off? You know, I think it, again, it just comes down to that consistency. And I know we'll be talking about the conversation of, well, what foods have vitamin K? So it could also look like making sure if you're having vitamin K foods, just, you know, switching them up is okay, but just being consistent in how much you have. And really we're looking at 
the, the large increases or decreases. I think just right. the, the small amounts we have probably won't cause massive changes. But again, if you're working with your healthcare provider and they're testing your INRs, they're testing your labs, then that's going to give us a little bit of a sign of like, oh, wait a minute, something's going on here. So for me, I'm more concerned about the big changes, right. um, little things here and there, not so much, but big picture consistency. I'm totally. just guessing there's, there's some fear uh, with people who are in this situation, there's like, oh my God, I can't eat this or I'm going to, you know, yeah. I'm going to have some issues, but it, you're saying it's not, it's not the little things. It's the big, big changes that you got to be aware yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. It's really the big things and making sure that you are working with your healthcare team, working sure you're communicating with them with any changes and getting your lab work done. Um, I think is just the big picture things of like, it's going to be okay. Just work with your healthcare team, but let's make sure you get that good, healthy nutrition along the way too. Yeah. And the lab yeah. work is like, pretty regular, like once a week or something, is it? Yeah. It is. Wow. Okay. That's, yeah. uh, that's why my dad's always getting, <laughs> getting, uh, appointments yeah. with the doctor. That's, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, having the lab work that frequently is important because there is the significant risk when it comes to clots. So we definitely want to make sure that someone's, you know, not at a risk of eating clots, but also that they're not on the other end of like, you know, if they end up falling or having an injury, their blood isn't going to clot and they're going to have an internal bleed. So it's kind of, sure. it's this, it's this really, it's just something important to monitor because it's a, Balance, it's a tricky right? thing. Yeah, yeah totally. totally. And so what foods are large? What, ha what foods have large amounts of vitamin K? Sure. So typically when we think vitamin K, we think of those dark leafy vegetables. And so I'll just list some and, you know, there's some high vitamin K foods that don't always fall in line with that, but some common ones um, with the green veggies, the asparagus, avocado, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, um, collard greens, coleslaw, dandelion greens, dark lettuces, oh golly, um, kale, spinach, but then also things like liver. Liver is kind of high in all the things, but yeah. liver, um, mayonnaise, if you're taking a multivitamin, um, that I know that's not technically a food, it's a supplement, but you know, oftentimes they have the vitamin K, mustard greens, okra, parsley, um, some nutrition drinks, like if you're drinking a supplement, like an insurer or a boost, those might have vitamin K, soybeans, the spinach, the Swiss chard, turnip greens, um, and even some of the oils like the soybean oils and the canola oils. So those are some of, I would say, big picture, the high vitamin K foods that we're being mindful of. Oh, and I say mindful, we're not avoiding these foods. We're just being mindful of them. <laughs> right, right. And consistency, like yep. you said, is yep. like <laughs> just having kind of the same amount most days. Like if you have one serving of green leafy vegetable, then keep doing that, but uh, keep it consistent. Yeah. Does the consistency need to be daily or can it be like three times a week I eat whatever one of these foods are? Would that be considered the same kind of consistency or does it need to be daily? Oh, golly. You know, I would say it depends on the volume of the food. So mm -hmm. if you're like consistently having a green salad three times a week, that is fine, you know, but yeah, I think, it, I think it's looking at the daily and weekly and getting your doses done or your labs done to adjust doses based on what you're doing. So, yeah, that's kind of what I figured that I just thought I'd try to get people to understand that. So yeah. That's my job here, by the way, is, <laughs> is the, I'm like the translator, the interpreter <laughs> of the, for, for the scientific else. and the, you know, our dietitian lingo, uh, compared to the lay yeah. person, I guess. Right? I ask those curveball <laughs> questions sometimes that this stops Sander in her tracks and she's like, I don't know. I've never thought of that. <laughs> But it's what we want to know. So, <laughs> yeah, I thought maybe Rob would ask this, but does cooking versus raw affect the amount of vitamin K? Like with cooked spinach versus a spinach salad kind of make a difference in terms of the vitamin K? Good question. Yeah, and, and this is a good question. I know you'd mentioned it to me before we got on the podcast. So I actually pulled up some research on this because like, you know, the food science of things is always so interesting. Yeah. Vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin. So it's yeah. not like the water soluble vitamins that will like if you cook, you might lose some of the nutrients out in the water. But when I was actually looking into this, the content of vitamin K in foods, it, it changes based on the type of food and the cooking method, which I thought was really interesting. So I oh. found this article. It was published in 2018 in Food Science and Biotechnology, and it was all about the effect of different cooking methods on the content of vitamins and true retention in select vegetables. And there was a table where it broke down different types of foods with vitamin K. And 
the cooking treatment method and how much vitamin K it had. And so I, I think for me, this is where it got really interesting because it's almost different by the different types of foods. It's not consistent across the board. A lot of the foods we actually see with cooking, the vitamin K increases. But again, oh. it varies based on food. And again, how you're cooking it. Are you boiling it? Are you blanching it? Are you steaming it? Are you microwaving it? And again, the table, it's table two in that reference. I'll, I'll give you the link if anyone wants to dive into it, because it's kind of a cool article, but it actually shows with the cooking method for each of these, like, you know, how much it has. So looking at broccoli, for example, steamed broccoli actually has the highest amount of vitamin K over the other cooking methods, like Actually, microwaving was very similar to raw. But anyways, it's, it's an interesting article, but I did pull a couple of quotes I wanted to share because I think it paints a good picture of kind of the relationship of cooking on vitamin K. Oh, and so the article shared that the effect of cooking on vitamin K has not yet been fully investigated, meaning there's still something we don't know. This, this is with most things related to the science. There's always, we know this much, but there's a lot we still don't know. We continue to learn as more research is being done. But increases may be because heat treatment causes vitamin K to be released. So they're acknowledging, hey, we're seeing when things are cooked, vitamin K actually increases. So maybe it's the heat treatment that's causing that vitamin K to be released. And then further, they kind of broke it down to the fact that the vitamin K is located in the chloroplast of the plants. So that's in the cells. And the cooking process may actually break down the cell plant walls, thereby releasing that vitamin K and making it more available, right? Oh, yes. So it's kind of interesting. And it makes sense when you think about it. And um, and then also they mentioned that vitamin K is relatively heat stable and is retained after the cooking process. So, oh. so the answer to this is like, Maybe. The, <laughs> yes, maybe the big maybe behind science and, and if i'm honest when i look at these numbers they're they're mo they're not these huge massive differences so for me eat vitamin k foods the way you like them if you like your spinach raw in a salad or if you like it cooked like i do with some garlic on the side for dinner eat what you like the best and again just remember that consistency and you know big picture we want to get good vitamin k foods for our health we want to be mindful of how much we're eating for the consistency piece as we're on war friend, but really it's eating what you enjoy. I think oh. that's the user friendly answer too. So that's yeah. what most people <laughs> probably wanted you to say. Well, it, that makes sense. And it, it's good. Yeah. That's a good advice actually. Just uh, keep it consistent and, and try to include things you like and they're healthy too. So that's a, uh, that's a great thing. Yeah. That's awesome. And, um, a couple more, what about, uh, other vitamin and mineral supplements? Sure. So I, I kind of mentioned earlier, like a multivitamin, but there's a lot of different supplements out there, different combinations for different people. So making sure that you are reading the labels and even in some foods, some foods will fortify their food product to like have a boost of extra nutrition. So sometimes vitamin K sneaks into foods or even supplements that we don't even think about. So oh. making sure that we're reading the labels and I always, I always recommend this if you're on Warfarin or not, if you're going to start any type of new supplement, it is beneficial to talk to your healthcare team because supplements, vitamins, minerals, they can interact with medications, not just Warfarin, but all the medications and, and depending on your medical situation, all the things. So I always recommend talk to your healthcare team before starting a new supplement, but some supplements we do recommend avoiding if you're on Warfarin, I'm a list. There's a few here. Okay. Coenzyme Q10, Echinacea, Garlic, Ginkgo Biloba, ginseng, green tea, and St. John's wort. And I do want to note here that this is really the supplement. So, you know, when you hear garlic, I'm not talking about putting some garlic powder on your, you know, on your food or cooking right. with garlic. I'm talking about the supplements that are a higher dose of the garlic. Okay. So if you are already taking these supplements, I, I do want to emphasize this. If you're like, oh shoot, I take ginseng. I would say, don't just stop taking it now. Talk to your healthcare team first, because the doses you're on with your Coumadin your warfarin are based on your current, you know, your current yeah. levels. And it's kind of like the vitamin K foods, you know, the start and the stop. So those are supplements I recommend you don't start taking, but if you are taking them, talk to your healthcare provider before just, you know, tossing them. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So you don't do like suddenly stop something that you've been doing consistently while you're on the warfarin or Coumadin because your INR levels are kind of based yep. on the dose yep. based on your intake. So yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. And what about uh, like fish oils or flax oil? 
Yeah. So this one is interesting too, because again, my, my, my disclaimers always talk to your doctor, talk to your healthcare (laughs) team, but fish oil and flaxseed contain omega-3 fatty acids, which are great for you. But there is some stuff that shows that it may increase bleeding risk when taken with certain medications like warfarin, but the research is mixed. And this was another one where I started diving into the research and oh my goodness, it's very mixed on what they say, whether or not it it causes issues with being on warfarin. So I would say for this particular supplement, talk to your doctor, the research is mixed. We might get a little more clarity in the future with more research, but there is a lot of research that shows that the omega-3 supplements don't have any issues long-term, but again- There's still some stuff we don't know. That's right. That's right. It's yeah, with the, and vitamin K research is actually fairly new. Like I was diving into some, like looking at, you know, what it's, what's it good for? Cause people are starting to take vitamin K and I always think, wow, it's a, it kind of could be a, you know, thick in the blood or it clots the blood. So, but I guess it's a real member of the keeping your bones strong to help with the blastocytes, like the building and the remodeling of your bone and the relationship with calcium. And it actually helps to reduce the calcification in the blood vessels and the stiffening of the arteries. So, so it's not like, I just don't want the public to think, oh, I got to stop taking vitamin K rich foods because it might lead to blood clot. That's not what we're saying at all. There's a huge cascade of, of uh, like steps that happen with blood clotting and and warfarin is a medication that that helps reduce blood clots and vitamin K is something in our diet that helps our blood clot so that's the relationship there but vitamin K has so many other roles and there's lots yeah. of different types of vitamin K so yeah. it's really important that you know people keep eating their leafy greens and their broccoli and liver and milk and everything else that they're eating if they're not on blood thinners or warfarin because they're healthy foods it's just if you are taking warfarin then you do need to have that consistency with your vitamin K intake. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point, Sandra, because vitamin K does so much good stuff in our bodies. And even like at the cellular level, all the wonderful stuff vitamin K does. And if we just avoid vitamin K foods altogether, that can result in some potential risks being deficient in vitamin K, increased risk of bruising, bleeding problems, bone issues, including higher risk of osteoporosis. So this is an important nutrient we need to have. And so I'm glad that we're having this conversation today (laughs) and hopefully educating some people who maybe in the past were like, oh, I can't eat greens. I miss my spinach. And so... (laughs) Yeah, I'm glad we're having this conversation. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was, well, your article um, on the geriatric dietitian, it really was very well, um, like it just was very concise and it had, it was to the point of like what foods are high in vitamin K and what's yeah. the interaction with warfarin. And it just spells it out so nicely that I really wanted to interview you for that because it's uh, it's an important issue. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Katie, Good. I was I was going to ask you too, um, because you're you work with geriatric population, I presume, uh, given the the name of your website. Um, <laughs> yes. Is this is this an issue that's more common with older people, or is this something that can affect? I mean, the, the need, I guess, to to be using blood thinners. You know, I will say we see more blood thinner use in older adults, but you know, everyone's situation is different. You could have someone who's younger and needs to be on warfarin, so it's. You, you see it more common in geriatrics, but these different issues can impact really someone of any age. And they can come from, I mean, the, the issues can stem from a variety of things, I presume. There's there's no sort of one thing that's causing everyone to be on blood thinners, I, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it is complex. And sometimes it comes down to genetics, too. I mean, we see sometimes these young, healthy people who will suddenly have a stroke. And it's like, what happened? You were so healthy. But genetics sometimes just plays this role. And so, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people can be on warfarin, but more common in geriatrics. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of what I thought. Awesome. Well, that's great. It was such a good um, overview of the relationship with vitamin K and warfarin or blood thinners. And um, do you have any other points that you wanted to add, Katie? Um, I don't think so. I think we I think we covered just about everything that I could think of off the top of my head. But yeah, nothing else. Awesome. Okay. Well, I always have a, I I was thinking of a question, actually, Rob and I were talking about this earlier and we want to just in terms of the audience getting to know you uh, personally. So what's your favorite potluck dish to bring to a family gathering? Yeah. uh, 
Good question. And I think I have two answers. So okay. it's kind of like two ends of the spectrum. I'm the person to either bring the veggie tray or the desserts. Now, if I'm really busy and I don't have time to make a dish, veggie tray. <laughs> it's <laughs> totally. easy, peasy, and fun, right? Yeah. But if I've got time to make something fun, I love desserts. So I like to cook a fun dessert. So that's kind of, I'm either all veggies or all dessert. That's the direction I go based on the time that I have. That's awesome. <laughs> that's a perfect answer from a dietitian. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Balance, right? right? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's uh -huh. great. Oh, well, thank you so much for all the great information and for joining us today in uh, on this call and the podcast. We really appreciate all the um, information you brought to the table. Yes. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for uh, sharing your time with us today. Katie Dodd, everyone. Wow, that was uh, quite an informative show. She knows her stuff. Yeah, really good. And remember the article, her comprehensive article is on the Geriatric Dietitian website. Website, yeah, that's with her website. And in the show notes, we'll link to that article. Yeah, basically what we were talking about today, probably a bit more information. And if you want to go over it to really get it to sink in, that's the place to go. And Katie's also on Instagram and Facebook with the geriatric or as the geriatric dietitian. All right. So we wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, vitamin K, I think you were saying, right? Just, we talked mostly about the warfarin diet, but we're going to talk a little bit about vitamin K and just the relationship it has and just about vitamin K itself. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I really want to stress that vitamin K for the general population is important to continue to eat the leafy greens and all those foods that we mentioned that are rich in vitamin K because vitamin K has a variety of roles in the body and it's not just coagulation with the K <laughs> yeah, or blood clotting. We made it sound like it's something you want to avoid, but that's only for people that are taking warfarin or blood thinners. That, correct. Yeah. That they have to worry about their, they have to be careful with vitamin K. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But for everyone else, vitamin K is something we need and Sandra's going to explain why. Well, and before you go there, let's just, the history of warfarin is really interesting. In 1948, it was a medical discovery that was like a, kind of like how they discovered penicillin. It was unintentional discovery that rat poison actually caused blood thinning. And so... In, in rats, you mean? In rats, okay. yeah. Yeah, so they got FDA approval to use warfarin to treat blood clots and then President Dwight Eisenhower had a heart attack that was widely publicized, and he was on warfarin to help with that and to help prevent further heart attacks. And it w became a common medicine that was prescribed for people with uh, at increased risk for blood clots. That's kind of a funny way to go. It's like, oh, I'm having a heart attack. Okay, get the rat poison. Here, we're going <laughs> to help you with some of this. But uh, no, that's not quite how it works, right? We don't need to be afraid of warfarin. No, because it was has a relationship to rat poison. That's yeah, and the warfarin it's an anticoagulation therapy that dissolves blood clots and prevents blood clots from happening again in people at increased risk. So let's talk about who are the people at increased risk for blood clots. I'm guessing anyone with circulatory issues, perhaps like um, heart stroke. Um, yeah. You you, yeah. you tell me some. <laughs> okay. Uh, people with, with heart valve issues or atrial fibrillation or previous DVT, which is a deep vein thrombosis in the leg, like a pain in the calf. Um, That's blood like circulation related to, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. And people that are smokers have an increased risk of um, blood clots and uh, people on hormone replacement therapy. So usually um, women through menopause and uh, people on birth control pills can be at increased risk for blood clots. And it's not the necessarily like the blood clot. It's the, what happens is the blood, uh, the clot breaks off and travels through the body and it could land in the lung and cause a pulmonary embolism. It could land in the heart and cause a, a heart attack, or it could land in the brain and cause a stroke. So that's why um, the blood clots can be dangerous and uh, 
something that you want to prevent. Yeah. So you could get like a clot in your in your leg. That's right. And and then a part of it would break off and travel to those other places you mentioned. Exactly. And that's when it becomes dangerous. That's right. So that's what uh, the blood thinning uh, medication and warfarin are the anticoagulant therapy or anticoagulation therapy that dissolves the blood clots and then prevents blood clots from happening in the future. Yeah, pretty important if you're someone who has uh, some of those potential issues. Exactly. But I did want to say that the general population is, uh, it's important to continue to have foods that have vitamin K because with vitamin K, there's all these other roles it plays in the body. For bone health, the vitamin K actually takes the calcium and puts it into the bone. So it, it helps with blastocytes and helps bone building. And that helps your skeleton and helps with bone health. It also helps in your blood vessels by reducing calcification in blood vessels and decreases the stiffening of the arteries. Wow. This is, uh, it's one of those little unknown uh, vitamins, I guess. We don't really know that much about vitamin K. I know. It's not like <sighs> one of the big three or however they're called. Yeah. Well, vitamin K is synthesized in the gut from our gut bacteria and it's stored in the liver. Hmm. And that's actually probably why the, you know, one of the foods that Katie mentioned that is high in vitamin K is liver. It's liver, right. Yeah. So it's stored in liver in animals too, like in um, cow liver and pig's mm -hmm. liver, but in human liver. And um, vitamin K has an anti-inflammatory effect. And it's probably because of that, it's with that gut um, brain connection and, you know, because of the it's synthesized in the gut from bacteria. Right. So studies show ge geographical differences, and these are fairly new studies, like in Japan, um, in Tokyo uh, versus Hiroshima. So in Tokyo, people eat NATO, which is a fermented soy product, frequently. And so they have high levels of vitamin K. And in Hiroshima, they don't eat the NATO as much, and their levels of vitamin K are a lot lower, and they have increased risk of bone fractures. Oh, wow. And the people in Tokyo that eat the NATO, the, the fermented soy product, actually have a significant difference in fracture rates, like lower fracture rates. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So there is like all these other things with vitamin K that are important for people to understand that it is an important vitamin. It's a fat-soluble vitamin that we do need to continue to have foods that are rich in vitamin K. Unless you're on warfarin or blood thinners, then you need to make sure that you're getting that balance and uh, going for your lab tests. And, and the consistency. With, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You got that, eh? That's the key. That is the key. Exactly. Awesome. Well, that's really good information. I'm, uh, I'm glad we mentioned that because it's, it's something, like I said, we don't really know that much about. It's not one that's in the, the spotlight as much as you know, the vitamin C, vitamin D, the ones that we hear about all the time. So yeah, good, uh, good info. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. It was a great topic to discuss today. Yeah, absolutely. One reason that people do get the DVTs, the deep vein thrombosis, they're sitting for extended periods of time, like on a flight, they're not getting up and moving around, or they um, may be laid up in bed because of illness and they're not moving around enough. So that uh, puts that at increased risk for the blood clot in the leg, yeah, the DVT, yeah. and it, you'd get a pain in the calf, and, uh, and that would be the sign that... Um, that could be a problem. Yeah, that's good to know. I guess office, sitting in a chair in an office all day too would kind of be similar. You got to get up. I mean, that's something that you're is stressed anyway. Like get up and stretch, walk around. I mean, you need to move your body so funny things don't happen to it. Oh, yeah, I know. We're all getting the city, sitting disease, right? We're sedentary for extended periods, and we do need to, like, stand up every 10 minutes. Like, if you're at a desk working, like, set a little alarm or a timer and, and stand up and move around. I think it's really important. Yeah, it's so easy just to keep plugging away, but uh, it's important to remind yourself to get up. All right, so... Uh we just want to thank everyone for tuning in again. Uh, we really appreciate your support. Um, remember, we have our social media sites you can visit us on, uh, Instagram and Facebook. We're My Wife the Dietitian there. Uh, we've got our website, also My Wife the Dietitian. Uh, there's a blog article. It's Katie's blog. Uh, we'll be on our website uh, if you want to read about that. Through the geriatric dietitian yeah. and the warfarin diet and vitamin K. So that will be on our blog. 
If you'd like to contribute to our podcast, you can do that through the show notes. There's a link there that you can go to a page where you can contribute. Yeah, so there's different ways to support the show. Uh, You can rate and review or donate to help the show continue to run because we love doing this and it keeps our stoke up to um, produce and broadcast the show. Absolutely. And we love hearing your questions too. We've we've got a few questions from people that uh, have been contacting us and we love being able to communicate with you. So if you are interested in sending us a question, we will talk about it on the show. You can email us at mywifetherd at gmail.com and uh, yeah, let us know what you're thinking. We love hearing from people. It's It's been great to interact and get the questions from the public. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to, it's nice to get some feedback. So uh, we really appreciate your support. And what are we talking about next week? All about protein. Oh, all about protein. So we're going to get into, like we talked about protein powder a few weeks ago, but this one's going to be more in-depth talk about all the forms of protein. And, and uh, so yeah, that'll be a good one to tune into. So until next week, yeah, enjoy, enjoy your week, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for joining us today on My Wife, the Dietitian. If you like what you heard, don't be shy. Leave us a comment or review and be sure to share our podcast with your friends. If you'd like to hear more, hit that subscribe button. You can also follow us on our social media pages for updates, episode trailers, and other odds and ends. For more info and links on what we discussed on today's episode, check the show notes. We'll be back next week with another informative and fun-filled episode. 